Good morning. It's uh, Tech for Senior. Uh, I'm Ron Brown. I'll be your host today. It's October the 24th. This is Tech for Senior 134th edition. <laughs> wow. Anyway, uh, today we have a great show for you. We're going to start with uh, our introduction. Uh, then we have um, Bob talking about security. I'm going to be talking about um, um, about your phone and um, actually your watch and measuring blood pressure on your watch. Uh, Bill's going to talk on Windows 11 tips. And of course, uh, uh, Huey's got, uh, he's going to be uh, talking about how to uh, compare quotes on goods and services. And Ray's going to finish up, of course, with our music segment. And we'll move into our question and answer. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, and if you're watching this as a YouTube short, just click the link and it'll take you right to the show. Uh, today, uh, after our uh, show, we have, of course, our uh, premier service. And today, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try and get it. I was having a bad week last week. The uh, I had it set to start tomorrow. Uh, it's, you, <clears throat> YouTube has a, a very odd naming feature so um anyway hopefully that it will start today at 10 30 on time i'll uh, i'll make sure i'm there to make sure that it, it is starting on time but today i'll be talking about the uh, misunderstood galaxy watch 4 uh which will it's a good match because today i'll be talking about uh, uh blood pressure control with smart watches uh huey's going to talk about chromebooks He's going to give you some tips on on Chromebook. So if you're interested in a Chromebook, that will be great. And of course, Bob is going to tell us how we can get Windows 11 tips. And this will all be on our uh, Premier service starting at about half past the hour. Uh, now, uh, we also have, uh, oh, and the link for that will come from our, um, I'll be putting that in our chat. And if you saw the Saturday newsletter that we have, of course, you will have, uh, the link will be in there. And also in our Saturday newsletter, we publish the agenda for today's meeting. So if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, we have a newsletter, it's, it's ad free and it's a free newsletter. So you get that on Tuesday and you get it on Saturday. And on Saturday, we do put the agenda in. This week, of course, we will be um, on Tech for Senior. On our Thursday show, we will be talking about email and what is the best email to use. And we have, of course, a very special guest that's going to join us on Thursday, and that, of course, is Mike Ungerman. He's going to talk. He's going to help us go through this. And we'll be reviewing, of course, all the, the news of the week. And we'll be, uh, be doing all that on Thursday morning. And if you miss that, we even podcast that out. So uh, we've got a busy, busy week. Oh, and the other thing is, Huey, what, what else is happening on Thursday? Uh, gee, I don't remember. Maybe it's something like learning Chromebooks. Yeah, learning <laughs> Chromebook came up again. So, so learning Chromebooks uh, will be will be on this coming this coming Thursday. So we have a busy week this week. Uh, of course, all weeks are busy coming up to Halloween. So let me introduce everybody. We have uh, the usual gang with us today. Uh, I'd like to, um, I guess I'll introduce Huey first. Huey and I, uh, 134 episodes we've been doing, eh? Who would have thought about it uh, <laughs> back uh, in March of two years ago? Almost three. We're in season three. Well, yep. Huey, we're going to be in season four pretty soon. Wow. <laughs> yeah, four years. So uh, anyway. Uh, yep. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're uh, now just to let everyone know, you're probably wondering about Thanksgiving and what's going to happen, um, next month. Uh, we've decided, of course we've done, we've decided that we're going to do what we did the last three years. Uh, we'll of course be broadcasting on Monday and Thursday, uh, but we're not going to do learning Chromebooks on, uh, on in, in November. So, uh, we'll be taking a break in November, but we will have the show on, on Monday and Thursday, even through the Thanksgiving holiday season uh anything you want to add to that huey uh you're nope. you're surviving you you're you're sort of post 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 uh, hurricane oh yeah it's it's another fall day uh 77 is a low and 84 is a high all right and of course uh, we have uh our pumpkin 
master here, Mr. Bob Gustisha. Bob, will you want to tell us about your pumpkin caper? Well, every year we have a pumpkin hunt for the kids in our community. And this year, that was for us yesterday. And we had 250 pumpkins that the kids from the neighborhood were able to go and hunt for. Of course, I knew where they all were because I was one of the people putting them all out there and hiding them. We have a park, <laughs> which I'm a VP. It's a 37 acre park. So there's lots of places. Kids got lots of exercise. And so we fill out the agenda properly. Besides the update for the security, I'll also be talking about a totally different topic. And that's apple seeds. Oh, there we go. We, we're looking looking forward to that. Very good. And of course we have, oh, Bill James is right. We'll, we'll get to Bill. We'll actually talk about Bill. Bill, you made it. I made it. I'm here. I like your background. That's really cool. Well, this is, um, this is um, um, National Security, Cybersecurity Month. So. All oh, right. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Well, Bill, of course, we'll be talking to Bill in a few minutes and he's going to give us some Windows 11 tips. And then, of course, we've got uh, Ray Baxter. Ray, how are you doing? Is it snowing in Pine, or what's happening over in no, Pine? No, it's about 45 degrees now. So, uh, but it's, <clears throat> we'll probably have our first sub-32 degrees, sub-freezing day uh, t tonight. So uh, I may have to turn the heat on before November 1. That's always been my uh, <laughs> That's so goal, much. not to have to turn the heat on till November 1. But the it may force me, but uh, I, I wanted to let you know, I, I finally made the switch. I upgraded my main desktop computer to Windows 11 uh, over the, the, this, this past week. Uh, I wanted to wait until I got the message on the computer in the update section that said your computer, no, it's waiting. I knew the computer could handle it. And now, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning a bit about it and it's not that much different. Things are just in different places. Well, Bill's got some tips for you today. And I'm going to, looking forward to that. That's right. <laughs> and Mike Hungerman, you're sitting there smiling because you're getting free free power. You're filling up your car with, ga no, not gasoline. You're filling it up with electricity, right? There, there you there's go. that orange cable right behind me. There you go. We, well, look for we look forward to doing the same. And, of course, we will be starting our, which I anticipate to be a very popular series on EV cars. And that will be starting next week. And Mike will be doing his first presentation on EV cars and certainly a topic we all will be thinking about as we move into the new year and more and more EV cars are showing up at dealerships. So uh, thank you, Mike, for doing that. We look forward to uh, to next week when we can uh, we'll be asking you lots of questions, I'm sure. I have I have questions for our audience in a survey. I'll put the link in the chat. Yes, we uh, we uh, we had the survey go out in our newsletter last week, and we'll be coming out again this Tuesday. So if you can please uh, fill out the um, the, the survey because we we want to find out what your interest is in this topic, and also it'll be uh, Mike. You're going to put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it in chat. We have 23 respondents so far. Very okay. good response. Okay, great. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we want to get going with the show because we have a huge show today and Bob says I can't talk too much. So, <laughs> Bob, I'm taking it away. <laughs>
but researchers worry that if more templates are added, the site could become exceedingly dangerous. See Bleeping Computer for more. Be Real has massive installs, but few daily users. According to market intelligence company Sensor Tower, social media app Be Real has topped 53 million installs, but only 9% of its active Android installs are opening the app every day. Typically, many users install apps out of curiosity, then abandon them due to lack of interest. An app's popularity is more precisely measured by the number of daily users. Instagram leads this category with 39% of its active installs opening the app every day. TikTok comes in second at 29%, followed by Facebook at 27%, Snapchat at 26%, YouTube at 20%, and Twitter at 18%. For more on this, see TechCrunch. Google Chat upgrades coming soon. To compete with Microsoft Teams, Slack, and even Zoom, Team Chat, Google announced that enhancements to Google Chat will soon be coming to Workspace. New features will include message threading later this month and custom emojis creation later this year. Next year, Workspace will introduce broadcast-only spaces to optimize presentations, as well as roll out APIs that will allow other apps to create and start meetings in Meet and initiate messages in chat. Google also announced extra security features that will help prevent sensitive information leaks. See The Verge to learn more. The Toyota data breach exposes source code and email addresses. Toyota disclosed a security incident where a subcontractor uploaded Toyota source code to a GitHub repository that was inadvertently set to public access. The source code contained an access key to a server where customers' information, such as email addresses, were stored. The company stated that up to 300,000 customer email addresses may have been compromised though it is yet undetermined whether or not any third party has used the access key. No other customer information, such as names, phone numbers, or credit card details were stored on the server. Toyota has started sending out apology letters to affected customers. For more, see Security Week. Czar Call tricks victims into calling a number. Active since at least 2020, Bizarre Call campaigns involve social engineering schemes where victims are tricked into calling a phone line for help and being led through steps to install malware on their own systems. The phishing scam begins with bait in the form of an email that tells the potential victim that they have been charged for the purchase or renewal of an online service. A phone number is provided for any queries. When users call the number, they get a bad actor, actually acting, who tries to use any number of social engineering techniques to direct them to a website, have them download a malicious file, and execute it. The hackers then have remote access to the victim's system. See the report by Trellix for more details. DJI drone tracking data exposed in U.S. Over 80,000 drone IDs were exposed in a data leak after a database containing information from dozens of airspace monitoring devices manufactured by the Chinese-owned DJI was left accessible to the public. Think twice before taking out your shiny new drone for a spin near the Cannes Film Festival, a prison, a nuclear power plant, or an airport. Enhanced security institutions use devices to monitor drone movement, posing a privacy risk to its owner. Recently, the Cyber News research team stumbled upon an unprotected database with over 90 million drone monitoring logs generated by DJI devices, the largest market player in the world that sells both drones and devices to surveil them. See more at Cyber News. This week's must-read on the Avast blog. 
How much do you know about cybersecurity? This five cyber awareness question quiz will help protect everyone in your family from the baby to grandma. Read the article at the link listed. Did you know video games have been found to be more effective at battling depression than therapy? Just thought you might want to know. That wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. So what happens if you eat an apple seed? Some seeds can be a delicious addition to your diet, like pomegranate or sunflower seeds. Have you ever wondered about apple seeds? While some seeds are safe to eat, apple seeds can be dangerous. My thanks to Kelsey Opal for her informative article which inspired this video. See the article at the link listed. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and get involved. Apple seeds contain amygdalin, a plant compound that can have a toxic effect. Amygdalin is harmless when it's attached to the apple. But if it's chewed or broken open, it can have consequences. After you eat an apple seed, amygdalin converts to cyanide poisoning in your body. Some mild symptoms include headaches, dizziness, and anxiety. More serious symptoms can include high blood pressure and a coma. The good news is that you shouldn't experience any dangerous symptoms unless you decide to eat a whole lot of apple seeds. Swallowing one on accident here or there shouldn't give you cyanide poisoning. It would take an estimated 85 apple seeds to make you sick. Cherry pits, apricots, and peaches also contain amygdalin. To avoid these seeds, carefully slice your fruit and remove the seeds. You should consider using an apple corer to stay clear of apple seeds. Are you curious what will happen if you swallow a watermelon seed? The answer might surprise you. They're actually good for you. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill James, where are you? I'm here. There you go. Take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Last month, we saw a um, um, two, uh, an important update to Windows 11, and that was the um, introduction of um, 22H2, which is, was the first uh, major update to Windows 11. So today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, those updates, and actually, it came in two forms. The first one was uh, September 18th, 2022, and it was uh, KB. 5017328. Uh, uh, that was the uh, first major update. And then followed by another update that was in uh, October 18th, which was um, the uh, KB5019503. Uh, and that is the one that brought about the new uh, uh, change to file manager. So I'm just going to talk about the uh, the uh, first four, and then we'll uh, follow later with the other four. Um, Do you want to share your screen, Bill? I will. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to give a live. It's, I'm going to be give you a live update. I mean, a okay. live presentation. That's fine. I'll share my screen. And uh, can everyone see my screen? Your lovely swans. Yes, that's um, a beautiful background that uh, Microsoft provides uh, every once in a while. It's a beautiful. So uh, the first one is that if you are, uh, is to access the control panel options in the settings app. So if you are accustomed to using the control panel, and even if you're using the control panel in Windows 11, 
you might be surprised to find that when you access device and printers and default programs, you'll be taken to the settings app in Windows 11. So this is a control panel and I'm gonna change it to um, large icons. So if I was to go to device and, um, and printers, if, that's, if I wanna make any kind of change, uh, typically you would, be, you would get what uh, used to be the applets in the control panel. But now when you click on that, it's gonna take you to Windows settings. So don't be surprised to see that that's going to be happening because Windows, uh, Microsoft is gradually migrating everything uh, from the control panel to settings. And that would be also true for the default programs. If you were to go to the default programs in, in the control panel, you'll be taken to settings in Windows 11. So just don't be startled uh, to find that uh, to be the case. So what I'm telling everyone is that you should try and to use the new settings menu as much as possible. And if you find yourself uh, unable to figure it out, then go to the control panel if that uh, option is available. But I would try to use the settings first if I want to make any changes to my, per, uh, to my PC, you know, if you want to change the display or whatever, try using settings rather than try than using the control panel. The other thing that has happened is that uh, now the search option in um, Windows 11 has taken a, a new uh, personality and that when you click on it, it's, um, it's, you come to what they're referring to as search home. And what you get is, um, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong thing. So when I click on my, my uh, spyglass here, I'll get something like this particular deal is that it's Happy Diwali. Now, whatever that is, I have no clue, but you'll find that every day there, there will be a new uh, um, trending, whatever you might call it, uh, on something for that particular day. And uh, it'll be denoted by having this little uh, icon to the right. And then it'll be something uh, particular about that particular topic. And then you can, of course, go here to learn more. And it'll bring up more information as well as all images. So uh, they're calling this um, search home. Now, the other thing that happens is that if you still want to search, you can still do so by just typing in the search bar here. Um, and um, let's see. So if I wanted to type um, in uh, Vitamix or whatever, I can still do the search. And you can see now it comes up with the best matches. Uh, there's, uh, in this case, this is a website, uh, but I could go to apps and then there's a document. I mean, there's an app here uh, that's in the Microsoft store. There's uh, a document that I've started. There's a web search. And then of course there's more. And you can delineate uh, email folders and music, whichever you want to search, that's still available. But um, but for the most, but the way it's working now is that when you first click on the search, you're going to get what's referred to as uh, the search home. One of the other things that has uh, occurred is that they have something that's called, um, you can copy content from the web uh, very easily, calls what's called web select. So if I was to go to a website that I wanted to copy something uh, for, um, let's see here. So if I wanted to copy this, I could just um, right click on the uh, item and you see something that's called web select. I can click on this and then I just need to take my cursor and just take it and then I can draw whatever I want to select. 
and then click on copy. And then you see copy. And then I could go to, um, let's just do a Microsoft Word document here. Do a new. And then right click and do a paste. And I have uh, this available. So that's uh, one of the new features of, of copying things um, from uh, a website to a document, whether it be an email or a uh, Word document, whatever you wanted it to do. Um, and that's quite different from um, um, using um, some of the other features, our, our, I should say the snipping tool. But anyway, those are sort of the things that have uh, uh, are now available in um, Windows 11. And I'll have uh, four more uh, tips for you later. One of the things that I'm really excited about is that in the October 18th uh, update, we got uh, tab, uh, uh, tabs in the uh, file manager. Uh, I have to say I'm struggling with that. I'm going to have to do some more practicing to figure out how all that works, but it has really transformed file manager into a whole different uh, uh, tool. So uh, we'll talk about that as well as uh, there's a couple other things that are coming like uh, suggested actions was another one that, that showed up in the uh, October 18th uh, update. So with that, that's our tips for a Windows 11. Back to you, Ron. Thanks, Bill. That's great. I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of questions. I have some questions for you as well, but we'll deal with those in the question and answer. All right. Uh, unshare yourself from the screen. I will. There you go. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Ray, I hope you're paying attention to that. <laughs> you got your new, here you go. Excellent. So yeah. today, uh, now I guess what I want to talk about today is uh, your blood pressure and uh, and your smartwatch. I've wanted to make this video for about a year now and I finally got it done. It's almost finished. Uh, I'm just waiting to, uh, there's a few rough edges, but I'll smooth those out. Wanted to play it for you today. Um, what you're gonna find is that the next big feature of smartwatches will be blood pressure. Your smartwatch will be able to take your blood pressure. I know everybody's waiting for blood sugar technology, but that's coming. And it, uh, but I think what you're going to see on most of the major carriers, the next feature will be blood pressure. The Galaxy 4 Watch, the Galaxy Watch 4 and 5, of course, can do your blood pressure. So I wanted to make a video about how this technology actually works. And so this is a fun video. Just sit back and watch it, and maybe you'll have some questions, uh, and we can answer those in the Q and A. So let's take, uh, it's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. Today I'm going to put on my physician's coat and we're going to talk about blood pressure. We're going to talk about the importance of blood pressure, how you take your blood pressure, and also the two new ways we're using to incorporate blood pressure into smartwatches. Yes, smartwatches can now take your blood pressure. So let's have a look at this, blood pressure and your watch. Why is this so important? Well, an elevated blood pressure is actually called hypertension. And the thing you should know is that it is common. It is extremely common to have elevated blood pressure, particularly as a senior. The second thing you need to know, this is a silent killer. This is a major contributor to heart and kidney disease. So it is so important that we pay attention to our blood pressure, get treatment for it, and follow it closely. That is why I'm so excited about new technology coming into watches that actually measures your blood pressure. Is this a game changer? Is this going to be better than actually taking it on your wrist or arm? No, not really, but I hope this will bring awareness and enthusiasm to patients so that we can be on top of this very, very common problem. So what is the difference between your pulse and your blood pressure? 
Well, as you know, your heart beats, oh, let's say 80 beats per minute. Well, we measure one pulse for each beat. So if your, part, we, if your heart rate was going at 80 beats per minute, then your pulse would be 80 beats per minute. If you're running or exercising and it goes up to 100, then your pulse is 100. So it's a measurement of how many times your heart beats per minute. Now, any activity tracker, watch, even the cheapest $10 device that you can get will measure your pulse. It is a super easy thing to do and easy to track how many beats per minute your heart is actually beating. Now, let's talk about your blood pressure. Your blood pressure is different. As you know, your heart contracts down and then it relaxes. That's called a beat. Let's say your blood pressure is 120 over 80. Well, 120 is what we call systolic, or that's when your heart contracts down and that is the maximum pressure in the system. The bottom number is called diastole, and that's when your heart is relaxed. It's the bottom pressure in the system. So we always have a top, which is the top when your heart contracts, and when it relaxes, that's the bottom pressure. So a blood pressure always has two numbers associated with it. As you know, you would need more pressure as we get taller. So think about a snake uh, slithering along on the road. Of course, it doesn't need much pressure to get blood to its brain. But let's take a giraffe who's in the forest and has that very, very long neck. It's going to need a massive heart and a lot of pressure to push that blood all the way up to the brain. So we've adapted over time to sort of figure out exactly how much pressure we need to provide oxygen to our brain. So as you can see, blood pressure is more complicated to measure than a pulse. We have two numbers. We have sort of a pressure number that we have to come up with. And we're going to need some more electronic and gadgetry to try and figure this out. And that's why there are very few watches that actually measure blood pressure. Today in this video, we're going to talk about the different technologies that are coming to allow blood pressure to be measured on a watch. All right, how is blood pressure traditionally taken? Well, you've all had your blood pressure taken, so you know there's a bladder that's placed around your arm. This bladder is then pumped up and relaxed, and we get a blood pressure. This is usually performed by your healthcare provider. In the last 10 years, we have seen automated blood pressure machines come and these are fairly standard now and you can get them for around 50 or 60 dollars and they provide excellent blood pressure readings and you don't have to do anything you just put the cuff around your your arm now we've seen this expand to cuffs on your wrist in fact there has been a watch which actually has taken your blood pressure and it's been available for a number of years and it actually has a bladder in the wrist strap and actually pumps up and relaxes. So there are many ways that we can take your blood pressure, but they all involve some sort of bladder being around an arterial source being pumped up and relaxed. Yeah. The other thing you should know is we can take your blood pressure in different arterial sources. For example, we can take a blood pressure of an upper leg. We can take a blood pressure of your lower leg. We can take the blood pressure of your toe, or we can take the blood pressure of your fingertip. Many different ways in which we can do blood pressure. A fun thing you can do is take the blood pressure between your left arm and your right arm. You'll often find a difference. So there is a standard of which we have defined, and all the medical research has all gone to being an observed blood pressure reading in your left arm arm sitting with your arm being at the level of your heart. And that's basically the standard by which we take blood pressure. Now taking blood pressure in a watch is going to, of course,
depart from this standard and let's look how we're going to do that. So how do we get blood pressure from a watch? You normally go into the doctor's office, he puts that thing around your arm. He then puts a stethoscope on your front of your arm and measures your blood pressure. Well, if we have a watch on our wrist and these little flashing lights behind, how does that measure your blood pressure? Well, there are two different technologies that we use. And I'm going to talk about those today and explain them. The first one is called the pulse arrival time or pulse transit time. So it's PAT or PTT. Both these are exactly the same thing. Now, as you know, when your heart contracts down, it creates a wave. It actually can create a pulse, and this is a wave that goes through the arterial system. And the pulse arrival time is the time it takes the pulse wave to travel between two arterial sites. So we can actually measure the time difference and come up with a blood pressure. So how do we do this? Let me explain. So the first thing that happens is when you get your Galaxy 4 watch, you have to calibrate it. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your own blood pressure cuff, put it on your arm and take your blood pressure. Let's say it's 120 over 80. You're then going to enter that into your watch and that's going to calibrate it because we know what your pulse is at that particular time. And this is going to calibrate the amplitude of your pulse and we're going to use that as a reference point for that specific blood pressure. Now, once it's calibrated, let's say you go out and you're doing some exercise and your blood pressure goes up. Well, that's going to actually change the time in which that wave transits between those two points we discussed. And so it's actually not going to measure your blood pressure, it's going to calculate it by the time difference in that wave. So a bunch of calculations occur and your blood pressure now is displayed on your watch. That's the technology called PTT or PAT. It's a calculation from your original blood pressure that you put into your watch. And that is why your watch needed to be calibrated. And it also needs to be calibrated about once a month to use this technology. Now you're going to say to me, oh, is this hocus pocus? Is this really work? Yes, it does work because Samsung has taken a lot of medical research and presented it to the FDA. The FDA has then had their body of experts look at this and said, yes, on the Samsung Watch Galaxy Watch 4 and Galaxy Watch 5, this is valid. We actually can get a valid blood pressure on this watch using this technology. Now you have to be very careful because there are a lot of $25 watches out there that will measure your blood pressure using some sort of technology. I have no idea what it is, but I can tell you that the Samsung Galaxy Watch 4 and 5 has been cleared by the FDA to be valid, and we really want to get accurate readings because your blood pressure is very important. So be careful on what watches you use and only get the certified ones. So what are the advantages of PAT or PTT? Well, it's relatively simple and it works well on watches. What are the disadvantages? Well, you have to calibrate it and that requires input on the consumer. So it all relies on what that initial blood pressure you put in to calibrate your watch. Because we're not actually measuring your blood pressure we're doing a calculation on a change in what you are measuring and putting into the watch. So for example, if you don't have a blood pressure machine and you've gone and borrowed one and you're using the wrong size cuff and you put a bad value in, 
then all your subsequent blood pressures will not be valid. Suppose you don't have enough money, you spend it all on the watch, and you guess, and you say, well, I'm just going to put 120 over 80 in, but that's not your real blood pressure. Well, then all the subsequent blood pressures your watch is going to give are all in air. So there's technology certainly has some problems and it all requires an accurate calibration. And each month you need to calibrate your watch and make sure that the correct values are there. Because remember, we're only measuring the change in the data that you're putting in that's taken by a traditional blood pressure measurement. And that is called pulse transit time or pulse arrival time. All right, the second way of taking your blood pressure is called photoplasmography. Oh boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Photoplasmography. Bet you can't say that backwards. We're going to call that PPG for short. And it's real simple. This is basically a technology that's been around actually since 1930. It's used widely in medical labs around the world. And it actually is where we look at the flow of blood through the arteries. And we use a photo sensor to measure your blood pressure based on a number of parameters as its uh, blood is flowing through the artery. And of course, as you know, the skin on the back of your wrist is very, very thin. And a lot of those sensors that we use are the ones that will be detecting the flow of blood in your wrist. And we can calculate this out and figure out what your blood pressure is. And that is called PPG or photoplasmography. And this is going to be probably the new way in which you move ahead when we're doing blood pressure with your watch. So in summary, we have two types of technology. We have pulse arrival time or pulse transit time, and we have photoplasmography. One, the first group is just measuring the difference from a blood pressure you are entering in. The second type is of course measuring your actual blood pressure. We'll see both these types used in future watches as this becomes more common. So it's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. Hopefully that video shows. All right, um, <clears throat> Huey, are you ready to roll? I am. Tech for Seniors present the website of the week with Huey Poplock. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Website of the week, number 16. I'm Huey Poplock. Compare quotes on products or services with thepricer.org. Search. Search for a product or service you want to buy, but are uncertain about its cost. They will give you all the articles they have written about that particular product or about similar ones from the same category. Read. Read a detailed article about the cost of your needed product or service, along with information on how and where you could get it for a cheaper price and why. Shop smart. Use the information you get from the site to buy the products or services you need for the best price. Let's go to the website, thepricer.org. This is thepricer.org. Let's take a look. As we scroll down, you'll see it. they have our newest articles. And there are several. What's the cost of a trampoline? Let's take a look at this using the immersive reader. If you want to encourage your children to spend their free time actively in the fresh air, a garden trampoline is a fantastic idea. So it tells you a little bit about how much it costs, generally between $250 and $950. With an average price about $450. It's by size. There are different brands. 
and styles, and then additional costs. So why buy a trampoline for your children? Here are some reasons to buy one. How to choose a quality one. So you can get an idea of some of the articles. It's by the newest first, it's in date order. Sometimes it's a restaurant and their prices. Sometimes it's a, a famous person and how much they're worth. And sometimes it's an article about a particular product or a membership in a particular group. Now let's come back to the top here and we can compare quotes on a product or service. Let's take an example of a walk-in tub and do a search. It gives us several articles. There's 13 articles. Some may or may not have anything to do with it. Some may be close to what we're looking for, but might give us some other ideas what we want to look at. But in this case, we want to look at walk-in bathtub costs. You'll see there's a picture of a tub, and then it talks about for the walk-in tub, expect to pay from $2,500 to $15,000 for one with many features. And then how does it work? They tell you a little bit about it. What could go wrong? First, you should enter into the tub and turn on the water. Be careful and don't get too impatient till you get the right water temperature. And even though it has a fast drain, you'll have to wait until all the water is gone to get out of a walk-in tub. And should the, the average working Joe get a walk-in tub? If you're a member of the family with mobility problems, a walk-in bathtub, even though it's pretty expensive, will be a nice way to give them just a little more independence, at least when they're taking a bath. Don't buy a walk-in tub out of laziness. If you don't have someone with mobility problems in your family, because as you'll notice pretty quickly, it won't be very comfortable. Let's try one more. In a similar category, let's take a look at a hot tub. Hot spring hot tub costs. Uh, In-ground hot tub cost is what we probably would look at. If you're looking for a hot tub and aren't planning to move anytime soon, an in-ground design is one of the best ways to go. And they talk about it and give you some suggestions, some information about it. Custom jacuzzis cost to expect uh, around $5,000, but could be $15,000. There's prefabricated hot tubs. And, and what are the benefits of a hot tub. And so it's a good article if you're looking for hot tubs. Another quote of a product or service, let's take a look at a Christmas dinner. Christmas meal for the entire family. This is a recent article, but I don't think some of the prices are as accurate as they could be. It's giving you about per person what it's going to cost. But what I noticed is a bottle of wine can be purchased for $6. I think that's going to be hard to, to do. So probably the other prices are going to be a bit low as well. But how to spend less on a Christmas dinner. And then should the average working Joe make a memorable Christmas dinner. And so it's a, it's a good article to look over. Also looking at the page, thepricer.org, at the top there are several categories where you can look at products and services as well. Let's look at the tech area. And you'll see some things that may or may not be of interest to you. Cost to repair a water damaged laptop might be one to look at. Most of the time you should not spend more than $110 to repair a water damaged laptop. While for the cheapest repairs you'll have to pay anywhere between $40 and $50. And there's various prices for different brands, and you can look at more, and they'll show you, give you more. And tells you about the Mac, Apple laptop, water damage, Dell laptop, Lenovo, Asus, and HP laptop water damage repair costs. Conclusion, accidentally leaking water onto your laptop can be one of the most daunting experiences the best solution in this regard, however, is to keep liquids far away from the laptop as possible. And if accidents still happen, you'll have to move quickly and call a laptop repair shop to make sure that your laptop is repairable. Let's look and see if there's anything else here that might be of interest. 
I like the Segway. Well, how much does the Segway cost? And the Segway Mini Pro, which is like a hoverboard, is $650. But most of the Segways are in the $5,500 or more, but in the seven dollars to $8,000 range. They talk about the Segway details and the different types and what the differences are between the different models and then what extra costs would be and then how to use a Segway and important things to consider. And then how can you save money? Well, by a used Segway might be a way to do so. Some of the other topics at the top include uh, travel, business, education, family and lifestyle. Uh, let's look at cooking and eating. Her menu prices looks like for most of these and there's a total of 25 pages of them. What about weird? What about a fur suit cost for conventions or something like that? They cost between $1550 and $3100. And it could be even more than that. Why do they cost so much? Because of a few different aspects. The buyer pays attention to every small detail before purchasing. Here are some reasons why the fur suit costs so much. Experience, labor, material, and then some extra costs. And making the fur suit yourself will reduce the cost. And then there's a conclusion for it. That's the pricer.org and comparing quotes on products and services. This has been Website of the Week number 16. I'm Huey Poplock. Thanks for joining. There you six go. Do $6 bottle of wine? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't think That's... I'm going to drink that. <laughs> no, I don't think I would either. If you could find one, it's yeah. probably vinegar. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, thanks to you for doing that. That sounds great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, Ray, just before we get going, I'll say goodbye to our YouTube uh, feed. And I want to thank uh, Gina Butler for her generous donation this uh, this week to our co coffee fund. And uh, that always helps pays the bills. Uh, thank you, Gina, so much for that. Uh, and thank you for coming if you're over on our YouTube feed. Uh, thank you for coming, and we are going to sign off now as we move into our music segment. If you want to come over and participate in our Q&A, maybe you've got some, some windows or blood pressure or uh, price, price quote questions, come on over and we'll talk about that in our Q&A. Excuse me, uh, Ray, um, Ray, are you ready to roll? Here we go, and there's my new Windows 11 logo. Oh, that looks pretty cool. I want to talk today about not a singer, but a disc jockey, Art LeBeau, the original oldie but goodie. So when you talk about pioneering radio DJs at the birth of rock and roll, Southern California's Art LeBeau would have to be in the conversation. Now, if there was an award for the radio DJ whose broadcast career was the longest, there's no competition. His radio debut was in 1943 at age 18 in San Francisco, at the time he was playing big band and jazz records. And his final show was earlier this month, just several days before passing away at the age of 97. That would be about eight decades of radio broadcasting. By the mid 1950s, when they rolled around, his radio show was unique since he was the first to encourage his teenage listeners to call the station to make song requests and dedications for this new music genre called rock and roll. He never stopped this format. He was also one of the first DJs to remote broadcast, typically at the long gone Scrivener's Drive-In restaurant in Hollywood. If you wanna know what that looked like, just picture Mel's Diner from the Happy Days TV show. Teenagers would hang out with him as he played their song dedications. This led to his producing live stage shows and dances at the El Monte Legion Stadium, which was actually a boxing arena in a more rural area at the time, east of Los Angeles City. Now, in 1958, LeBeau formed his own record label, Original Sound Records. 
and released his first Oldies But Goodies LP. I wonder how many of you have one or more of those. The songs on the album were only a few years old at the time, but they were the ones his radio listeners were requesting, so he figured the album might sell well. This original compilation album stayed on Billboard's top 100 chart for 183 weeks and led to a total of 15 oldies but goodies albums of songs from the 50s through the 70s. I had the pleasure of meeting Art in person in 1990 when he attended a live stage show I helped produce. The main musical attraction that night was the Los Angeles-based vocal group The Penguins, featuring original lead singer Cleve Duncan. They had the hit song Earth Angel, released in 1954, a song Art heavily promoted on his radio show. Now, the YouTube link uh, below and the one I'm going to play tonight is actually from a PBS show in the early 2000s. But just for Tech for Senior today, I'm going to first show a quick footage from my personal video collection of Art LeBeau introducing the Penguins at the 1990 concert. The Penguins. Yeah, Memories. <laughs> yes. Memories, eh? Wow, that's. And I, you know, having the pleasure you know, to meet so many of these singers in person uh, was was really a highlight of my life. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ray. We look forward to next week, and 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 many weeks in the future. All right, I'll be here if you want me. Yep, we we certainly do. So thanks, thanks so much. Uh, well, you know, another week has gone by. Uh, uh, wow, that hour just went by so quickly. Uh, anyway, uh, for those of you who uh, are, have to leave, don't forget um, the Misunderstood Galaxy Watch 4, the uh, Chromebook tips, and Windows 11 tips, all at 10.30, uh, or uh, sorry, at half past the hour, depending on where you are uh, listening. But it'll be uh, in, about, uh, in about 30 minutes, we'll be starting the premiere service. And once it's broadcast, of course, it is... Um, it is uh, it is up permanently, so you don't. If you can't make it, you can certainly go back and watch it. I put the link in the uh, show notes uh, and in the chat, and so they should be there for you. Just click that, and it'll take you there. We'll be, uh, of course, the gang, including Mike Ungerman, will be this Thursday. We're going to talk about uh, uh, what email service you're using, and also all the news of the week, and that will be on Thursday morning. But it's not a Zoom meeting; it's a um, we broadcast this out on StreamYard, so it will either be on our YouTube channel or Facebook. And, of course, the links are in the newsletter and on our website. So hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. Now we're going to open this up uh, to question and answer. We've got everybody here that presented today. And I have my first question I have for Bill James. Uh, so, Bill, in the web version that you gave in the copy and paste that you showed us how is that different from just copying just hit just copying just selecting a, a bunch of the the space and like snippet and copying it over into um into uh, a word document what is so special about that web copy well it's just an opinion but i think it's more convenient because you're already on the website so you just right click and you can just go ahead and uh, copy whatever you want rather than have to go down and choose the snipping tool. But you have uh, to be usually, using Edge. Yeah, you have to be using Edge. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, okay. it's already built into the context menu. And you just right click on it and you can select it rather than going down and having to use the uh, snipping tool. That is, as Bob says, if you're using Edge. Okay. Right. And somebody in the, in the chat also asked a question about does it copy live links? And that question to that is no, it's just an image. Just an image. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Drew, you've got a question. Go ahead. Well, there we go. Um, my question I have a Galaxy Watch 4, like you do, and I'm Curious, where do I go in the watch or in the software to start the process of my, of put programming in my baseline blood pressure and how do I how do I take my blood pressure? Okay, so in the gal first of all, it's important that uh, you that everybody understands you have to have a Samsung smart 
um, not smart watch. You have to have a Samsung phone in order to be able to use the health app in the Samsung watch. So Drew, do you have a, what phone do you have? I have a Samsung Galaxy S21. Yep, that should work fine. You just need to uh, download the uh, health app and, and set, it, set the watch up. There's a number of videos out on how to do that. Uh, so there is a bit of software that you have to install on your phone. And then you follow the links and it should be able, and, and in fact, in the, um, in the, one of the slides I had on my, uh, in the presentation is off the, uh, is off the Samsung website on the three steps you need to do to set it up. So there it's, uh, all the information is right on the Samsung website. So just go there and it'll give you the steps, the step-by-step -step procedure that you need, but it should work just fine for you. Thank you. Uh, Stan, go ahead. Hello, Stan. There you go. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I just posted a long, uh, actually a memo in the uh, chat. The Central Florida Computer Society has had a tech SIG probably 30, 35 years, a monthly meeting, uh, non-orchestrated. It's just around the table chat kind of thing. You bring in your latest projects, your repair jobs. We have one MacGyver type guy who regales us all. It's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. If any of you would like to attend, send me your email address, and I'll be sure you get the link. Thank you, so Stan. Been the boot for many years, and if you'd like to give it a shot, uh, we welcome you to come. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Stan. Thanks a lot for the information. Kathleen, go ahead. Yes. Um, what info I have an Apple Watch, but what information does the ECG part Tell me, if anything, or what do I need to know to understand whatever information it's giving me? So the uh, on the Apple Watch, and uh, you have an app, you have an iPhone, do you? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Gives you a lot of information. Uh, Apple Watches are great. They're, they give you a lot of information. Uh, there's a number of things that it does. It uh, First of all, it will tell you how fast your heart is beating, which is sort of cool. It'll tell you if you're, you know, exactly what, what, how fast your heart is going. That's the first yeah. thing. The second is, thing is, hmm, what, is what is the ECG part tell you? Okay. So that's the next part is there oh, is okay. a, there is an ECG feature, which you can do. And the ECG feature on there specifically tells you only one thing. And that is whether you have a condition called atrial fibrillation. So if you feel your chest fluttering, you feel something, you feel a bit unwell, you feel that you're not doing well, then you can actually activate that ECG feature. And it will, um, and it will of course, uh, tell you if you have atrial fibrillation or not. And that's all it does. Okay. It doesn't tell you if you're having a heart attack. It doesn't tell you to go to the hospital. It doesn't tell you anything like that. Uh, it just tells you if you have atrial fibrillation. Now, there is also another feature that, of course, I talked about last week called the irregular heart rate notification. And you can turn that on. And that actually samples your heart rate through the day and night. But that brings up another important thing is that if you are wearing a smartwatch and you are using the health applications, you really should wear your watch 24 seven and you need to wear it overnight because a lot of the, a lot of the sensors that we use work overnight. Anyway, to make a long story short, Kathleen, it, it, it will sample your heart rate through the day and look for atrial fibrillation as well. So not only does it do it when you hit the ECG button, but it'll sample it, sample it as well. And so those are the, and, and so those are the, some of the main features that, uh, that your um, that your watch will do, and 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 Apple certainly does a very good job with that. And no blood pressure on Apple. No blood pressure on Apple. They will likely, I think, that the next. I'm I'm almost guaranteed. I'm almost a hundred percent sure, but that's really hard with Apple. Is that the next watch that comes out? It will not have blood sugar, but it will have blood pressure. I think that I think the technology is there, and I think that's that's the next major feature that Apple will be bringing out. Thank you so much. Very okay. helpful. There you uh -huh. go. Anne-Marie, go ahead. I have a comment because I do have AFib Kathleen and I use my watch all the time to monitor it. It'll tell me when it comes on and it also tells me uh, when it's irregular and it also tells me when it's a low beat. It does a little yes. buzz at night, so it right. wakes me up. Yep. Yep. So it's fantastic great. is all I can tell you. My, really my well. cardiologist for the first time 
acknowledged that it's really a good thing. And he said, just use your watch to monitor yourself. And did you get your cardiologist to watch Tech for Senior? It, no. <laughs> <It's too laughs> you got to talk to him about Tech for Senior and get him to watch it, right? You'll learn something. But the first time he admitted that it's a good tool. At first, there, when there I first go. got the watch, what, three years ago, they poo-pooed it all. You know, I know, right? I know, now I know. They it's come it's around. education, right? It's yeah. education. You got to educate these doctors. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. My the, question is, yeah. I actually have a question. Uh, you mentioned casting from your uh, smartphone to the TV. How does that right. work? From my uh, iPhone? It's built in. It's built in. How? It should, if, yeah, if you have a smart TV, it should connect to your... Uh, should should connect to your TV and it should just go right from your uh, from your from your phone to your TV. Yeah, how do I do it? Uh, it'll be a broadcast. There's a broadcast feature on. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. 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 There's a broadcast feature on your iPhone. Just go there and it says connect to TV, and you should be able to. Under settings and then broadcast. Yeah, I think so. I don't have an iPhone, so I'm not exactly. Oh, I'm not okay. exact, and I'm not exactly sure. I've never tried but, that, but it sounds interesting. I might. It is. It. it is, and a lot of people use their phone for their TV. It just connects. It connects very easily, and it's a. Crazy. Ron, I think the icon is the same on the um, iPhone. It looks like a little screen with rays coming out of it. With it, it's the same thing. Oh, okay. okay. I will look. Yeah, right. I, I think on the iPhone, you actually need to download the Google app if you're going to Chromecast. Otherwise, you do AirPlay for the uh, iPhone. Airplay. Airplay. Okay. I Airplay. have that on for my car, so it should be it on. That's on the app, really. Yeah. There okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. There you go. The other thing that I wanted just to mention to everybody, it's so important, um, is that um, is that when you, if you are planning on taking using a watch to do that, it's so critically important that you take your blood pressure correctly and put that first blood pressure in. It has to be an accurate reflection. Which brings me back to the other issue that is a sore point with me is you need the right size cuff when you're taking your blood pressure. One cuff does not fit for all people. And so um, it is so important that you get the correct size cuff when you purchase your blood pressure uh, device. And the cuff, um, uh, and so when you purchase them, you'll find out that it's small, medium, large, but most people, I find it's either large or extra large. So when you're when you're purchasing it, you need to know that there are different sizes of cuffs. And how you can determine the size of the cuff is you take it and you'll take it and hold it lengthwise, not, not like around your arm, but hold it widthwise over your arm. And the width should cover, should be about two thirds your the 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 uh the width of the cuff should be about a third more than the size of your arm so um you need to you need to please make sure you're using the right size cuff and and that is why i put that clip in the video i did that that lady that was taking her blood pressure and she was trying to get that cuff on there and it was it was really a chore it was way the cuff was way too small that's that's going to give a terrible blood pressure and that's why i put that little note in the in the video so please make sure you're using the right size cuff olive go ahead yes uh, i was curious on uh, casting from the phone to the tv is that using data or should you use your wi-fi connection and turn wi your wi-fi use wi-fi and don't use uh, your server it's not using data no it's not using data wi-fi Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a good video. We should probably do it's a, it's a good technology and it's it's the modern technology. I don't see connecting anymore with wires or cords or stuff like that. Elaine, go ahead. I hope this is a simple question for at least Bill James. Um, I was using Word the other day, doing a lot of cutting and pasting and cutting and pasting with Control C and Control V. And I accidentally hit control twice and I get a little round white dot on my page. <laughs> I have no idea why. And it was not magnifying what was there. I couldn't move it around by clicking and scroll, you know, moving it. Um, any idea what made that little white dot on my page when I hit control twice by accident? If it's what I'm thinking it is, it's a it's a formatting tool that if you click it, it'll change the the appearance of the text that it appears oh. in front of. 
it obliterates the text that it's in front of, though. It I mean, did? Just, yeah, there was just the little white dot there. I don't I, see I, that I, you I, have your mouse it, being If it happens tracked. consistent... Go ahead. Go ahead. If, if it happens consistently, every time you double tap the control key, it might be a setting that you have in your um, control panel for your mouse. Um, it's a it's a it's a help locate your mouse on the screen feature. Oh, uh, but that's a single click, off. not a not a. Double yeah, click. I think because uh, I've gotten those dots also. And the last time, the first time I got one. It, when I when I clicked on it, it actually changed the formatting of the text that it was in front of. But it didn't give you any choice, you know. To no, it doesn't give you. Uh, it doesn't give you any choices, and um, I noticed that. I think that's a new feature that's come up recently. Let me I check. Go ahead. I had recently installed the tool thing that you had talked about a couple of weeks ago for Windows, and I didn't know if that could have anything to do with that, but I don't even know how to get out of it. There was no X to exit out. Did you try to use the escape key? No. I'll try that next time. Um, and I'm going to try that because um, I did that accidentally, and I got the dot, and when uh -huh. I clicked on it, it actually changed the formatting of the text. And well, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I think that's something new that uh, has been introduced in 365. Oh, okay. But I had I'm a document up the other day and I did that. And um, let's see, I'm gonna try it right now. How, do, how about using the back arrow? Well, that would, no, that would take it out, but um, okay. Control key. Well, this document I'm working on, I don't see it, but it did happen to me the other day when I was um, uh, working on a document. I got a dot on the side and I clicked on it and it actually changed the formatting. I mean, right. I put, I'll everything, try. I put everything oh. in brackets. Oh. Hmm. So, um, anyway. Let me the easiest out. thing is to get out of it. I'll try using escape and see if yeah. that works. I would. That's what I would do. Thank, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. More on that. Drew, go or Dick. Sorry, Dick, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I have a similar question. Uh, once you've uh, picked out the area that you want to uh, save, is there a way to just save it as an image rather than pasting it into a document? Oh, save using the, the web... Um, I have not tried that, but let it me is, see. Here. It is strictly saved if you're using the Edge browser. It's not when you're using anything else. This is a feature within the Edge browser. And it, once you use it, you can paste it someplace else that will accept an image. Yeah, it's you putting it in the clipboard. Yeah, it puts it in the clipboard. It doesn't uh, say, it doesn't uh, allow you to save it. But you know, the clipboard, um, now it has is dynamic, so you should be able to get that save by uh, I think it's Control V. If when I want to save something as an image, I usually uh, paste it into Paint, and then you can save it usually uh, as an image. And yeah, that's at a least good idea. It works for me. That's a good idea. That would work. Yeah. If you but paste Bill it any place, then you'll be able to save it. Any right. place that you can manipulate images. When you first save it, it is sim simply saved to the clipboard. Right. That's what it does. But but Copy. with your clipboard history that you can bring up, you can look at all the stuff you've pasted into your clipboard, right? So it does save it in the clipboard. So all that you have to do, right. you could just save it all to your clipboard, couldn't you? And then just go back well, and look at your clipboard Unfortunately, I'm, I'm looking at my clipboard and those images that I save are not there using that oh really oh, okay do you have the multiple clips saved uh bill yep i just use uh, it's windows key v uh and um i'm looking and the only uh, uh clipboard items i have are the ones that are text i don't have any images hmm. all right so all of do you have a question or an answer for us <laughs> 
actually more of an answer. For years, we've just used WordPad for uh, taking right. the clipboard right. items into it, and you can, you know, then save the whole document with all the various ones you have. And also, if you capture text, you can put it in the notepad, and you won't have the large file that uh, you would have in WordPad. Yes. All right. Well, listen, uh, we have to run. It's now uh, 20 minutes past the hour, and I'm going to give everybody a 10-minute break before our premier service starts. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, um, uh, thank you, Steve, for reminding me last week that the premier service didn't work, but I wasn't there, so I'm sorry I couldn't get it going. So thank you so much for keeping me on the ball and honest on that, Steve. Um, and then uh, we'll see everybody in a week's time. Uh, Steve, did you have one last 10-second question or comment? The uh, clipboard, if you save it, it saves it to a file with a file name of CL7. So if you look for files with CL7, that's a saved clipboard. Okay, thank you, Steve. Pamela, did you have one last short question or comment? Well, um, I have something weird going on with my TV that just started last night. It keeps booting off and on. Anybody uh, have any idea I've unplugged it? I've unplugged AT&T U-verse. Um, not sure what my next step is. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, we just don't have that time to answer that question right now. Can you bring that up next week? Uh, I, it, maybe you'll have an answer next week. I have a <laughs> similar. I had a similar problem, and I resolved it by replacing the batteries in the remote. Okay, I just did that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming, everyone, and we'll see everyone in a week's time or this Thursday when we'll have our tech for senior live. And don't uh, forget now. learning Chromebooks. And don't forget learning Chrome. That's right. Thanks for learning Chromebooks on Thursday. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.